Hello, and welcome to a podcast from the St. Raymond Anatas Foundation for Freedom, Family, and Faith. My name is Ann DeSantis, and I'm the Executive Director. I'm joined by Deacon Patrick Kennedy of our Archdiocese of Philadelphia, where our conversation will be about marriage enrichment, and we're also going to learn about his life, faith, and ministry. Welcome, Deacon Pat. It's so great to have you here on the podcast. And it is equally welcome. Um, for Thank you for bringing me here. Yes, it's awesome. And of course, I met you at one of our Archdiocese of Philadelphia events, got to know you, got to know your mission and the work that you do to help promote good marriages throughout our own Archdiocese here in Philadelphia. So I just want to thank you for your work. Well, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's uh, really a, a privilege to do what I do. Um, clearly a calling that was uh, unexpected and a calling that, uh, though embraced, has um, allowed me to enter into a mystery that I would have never imagined and opportunities that I would have never had. So it's been a, a, a great um, opportunity and a great um, gift that the Lord has given to me. It comes well, with its struggles. It's to all of us too, here in our <laughs> archdiocese. It's a gift that you're, what you're doing in your ministry, your work, and in tr trying to help to strengthen through the ministries of the archdiocese marriages throughout our entire greater Philadelphia area. I'd like to read your bio because you have a beautiful bio that kind of really explains fully who you are and your, your family life and just what you've done throughout your career. So I'd love to read that now is that Patrick J. Kennedy, Deacon Pat was born in 1950 and raised in the Ken Kensington section of Philadelphia. After graduating from North Catholic High School, Pat enlisted in the U.S. Army and after serving a tour in Vietnam was honorably discharged in 1971. Shortly thereafter, he met his wife, Diane, and was married in March, 1973. Together, they were gifted with seven children, two who died shortly after birth. Today, they have five adult children, all married except one, and have nine grandchildren and one more expected in July. Pat's work career began as a truck driver. Then he became a Philadelphia firefighter and later a paramedic. The experience prompted by the loss of their first infant daughter led to the establishment of a specialized medical transportation company, which Pat served as its president and CEO for 20 years until it was acquired and merged into a national public company. After serving in a senior corporate role with a new acquiring entity, Pat left the company in 1997 to accept his final career position as the senior vice president of Holy Redeemer Health System, retiring in 2017. In 2010, Pat entered the diaconate formation, and in 2017, he was ordained. Today, he is assigned to the Archdiocese Office for Life and Family, handling family-related matters, and assists at the Cathedral of Saints Peter and Paul, St. Ambrose Parish in Philadelphia, in his home parish at St. Charles Borromeo in Cinnaminson, New Jersey, and also supports the, bis the bishops, serving as a master of ceremony for liturgical activities throughout the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Deacon Pat is currently a member of the Deacon Council and a member of the Board of Directors and Treasurer for the Philadelphia Pro-Life Union. Pat and his wife, Diane, currently reside in South Southern New Jersey. Beautiful bio, Deacon okay. Pat. And it's been an honor for me to get to know you just through our phone calls and a couple of the events in our greater Philadelphia area. You're a real family man. Maybe we can start there. Uh, you, your wife, and your kids and grandkids. Well, yes, I um, life. Uh, as you read the bio, it's it's very odd um, hearing someone read your bio because it kind of, in some degree, grounds you in the reality of a couple of things. For me, that I'm old <laughs> <laughs> and that I've been through quite a few different cycles, if you would like, of life, and are still. Uh, experiencing one that again was really not planned, not for uh, something that I had uh, sought. But first and foremost, you know, I am, a, I probably identify myself first as a husband because that is the primary vocation outside of the diaconate. That is the primary vocation. It's the vocation that in some degree matured me from a boy to a man and through that manhood. Um, through the compliments that my wife shares with me, 
uh, I've become a better person, a, a more wholer person in both spiritual and human sense. It's, uh, it's kind of completed me. It's that old Jerry Maguire movie, You Complete Me. Well, in, in, in many respects, as you grow old together, that's exactly what really happens. So first and foremost, I'm a husband. And my now second vocation is as a deacon in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, uh, a role that I didn't um, ever really seek, wasn't a role that I had um, ever had a really uh, an inkling to do. Uh, certainly I've always admired the deacons um, from afar at mass, but it wasn't something that I felt that I would ever do. But somehow as retirement started to come into view as I end of my professional career, at seven years prior to that, we began, my wife and I, to talk about, well, what does retirement look like and where are we going to go? We had some thoughts about them, um, you know, going to the shore, living in Cape May. I loved fishing, so I was, had this thought that I would just get on a boat every morning and float around the bay, come home, we'd cook food, and life would be really simple and easy. Well, God must have been laughing very, very <laughs> much because retirement never seemed to end. It just transitioned from my professional life into my diaconate life, which again was um, something that my wife also in some degree, uh, not in some degree, in the fullest degree, without her consent, I would have not been able to become a deacon. And so with her consent and with her patience and with her sacrifice, She's allowed me to be the deacon that I am. Again, anything that I do is much like in any marriage. I take from her and I give to someone else. We together take the time that we would have normally shared. And we offer that in a, in a different uh, ministry. And so she is much a part of my ministry as I am. I may be the face of it and I may be the voice of it. But clearly she is the one that has kind of formed me to be who I am. And then in addition to outside of that, I'm a grandfather, which is a great joy. It's, um, I always try to say to couples that, you know, certainly when you enter into marriage, you enter in this great love and it's full of a lot of different emotions. And then comes kids with all the challenges and the problems. And sometimes it kind of, um, kind of covers over, if you would like, some of those great passions and replaces it with the great struggles that life has. But when you finally get to that point of having grandkids, well, you start to really understand love in its most simplest and purest form. It's just great to have grandkids. I just, I, I've been blessed now with nine and probably seven eights. I got uh, a month to go and my 10th grandchild will, will come. Although we don't know my uh, daughter and uh, son, uh, daughter-in-law and my son, uh, they have a uh, not I, I, not in the identity issue, so we're always hoping. My One of my hopes is that I have mostly girls and I'm looking for an heir. Um, and so I'm hoping and praying that uh, my uh, uh, grandchild will be a boy. Um, but no matter what, what the, that would be the case, um, we'll certainly um, experience that great love. And then outside of that, um, you know, I... Um, just a, um, a a person that loves the work in the church. I I love very much as just a um, uh, uh, just another person who enters into the church, who uh, likes to um, have um, you know the various different uh, interactions. Uh, church has always been an important element of my wife and I. Um, it's really been our community. It's been our both our social community, our spiritual community. It's been the centerpiece of our family life. And so there are things, that's who I am, it's kind of wrapped up in, a, in that picture. Yeah, what a life you've had. I, I just wanna congratulate you on your beautiful family, including your, of course, your wife, your children, your grandchildren, and just the way that God has guided you during all of this time up until now, and now continuing, like you said, your ministry, because you didn't know when you were going to retire, what direction God would have for your life, but he certainly had something very big in store and that you are a permanent deacon. And so would you be able to share with us, what is that like for you being a deacon? 
It is such an honor to there, be there on the altar every single week and also ministering to people, proclaiming the gospel. Tell us a little bit about your work as a deacon. Well, the work as a deacon is, um, it's like in, in many respects, it's kind of like marriage. In the beginning, there's great excitement and great anticipation, a little bit of fear and anxiety and thoughts, all those kinds of human uh, emotions that um, are present and they're necessary much like taking a new job or entering into a new life or doing anything like that, there's great excitement. And then you enter into the realities of being a deacon, which is work. It's, it's um, working with people who are struggling, um, much of what I do in the lines of, of being able to listen to some of the people's struggles and challenges and problems. Most of the work of a deacon is really focused on charity and the word. Obviously, a deacon is giving the privilege. There's two really beautiful privileges that occur in Mass. The privilege to be able to proclaim the gospel. And then the privilege to obviously be able to unravel that in preaching. And then the second privilege is a privilege that uh, I take with great, um, great reverence and with also great humility. And that is the opportunity to stand next to the priest who in this moment is in Persante Christi, in the person of Christ. And I jointly raise the chalice with the precious blood in it next to the host. And so in some degree, I enter into this present moment of representing humanity, which is mingled with the divinity of Christ and takes the offerings that come from the community. And I kind of stand as the representative of the general um, community and offer this. Um, the chalice with wine, some of them are a little weighty, but for the most part, they're very manageable. But I always think when I do that is the, when I'm holding, I'm holding the chalice of salvation. I'm holding the blood of Christ. There is a great weight there, and I always pray to the Lord, give me the strength to hold it up proudly, but humbly. And so that's the two great gifts of a deacon. Outside, again, just the inner, this great interaction. Putting a collar on both has a great responsibility um, in the lines of always in the image of, of, of the church, always trying to be a good um, disciple of Christ. And so I must always be first and foremost um, recognize that that role and that responsibility that I have to be careful in everything that I do, that I properly display the image of Christ throughout the world. And so that um, is the first thing in putting on a collar. It's the second thing is it attracts a lot of people to you who, again, have problems and challenges and have needs, and they just need somebody to listen to them someone to reassure them. We say the role of the deacon is very different than a priest because we kind of live in the same environment, in the same life, in the same struggles, have families and children. And um, sometimes, you know, again, as marriage, it's not always great. It's, you know, there are periods of struggles and challenges. Sometimes you can gloss over people's um, resumes and admire them and say nice things, but the reality is most of us are just like everybody else. We struggle, we argue, we, um, we um, you know, just um, try to get through life in the, in the best way we possibly can. Part of my role now as a deacon is to help those people to understand that and to kind of point them to the person that can um, help them uh, with those struggles. I always say we need many times we need to go beyond the human instrument and go into that supernatural one. And so my job really is to kind of redirect people in prayer and to help them find Christ in the midst of their struggles and challenges and to live in the hope that God offers to us as we go through this life. So that's um, the, the, the um, great honor of being a deacon. It's a great ministry. It really is. It also has its challenges. Um, you know, the church uh, parishes, most people know this from living in, uh, you know, being a member of a parish, but there are always issues. There are people, human beings, priests, deacons, laity, 
we're all complex people. We all have various different problems and challenges. We all have opinions. So there's always somebody who will comment and say, I didn't quite get your homily, or I didn't think your homily was this, or I challenge you on this particular point, or I see this, or I see that. Um, you, the one thing you just have to be, and the most important thing of the role of a deacon is charity. It's just to kind of live in love, express things in love, absorb the struggles and help direct people in love. It's the greatest gift. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I think it's very well said when you mentioned that you've kind of got your feet in both places, family life and really as a vocational person, a, a clergyman. And so you're bringing those two worlds together and being able to not only minister to the people in your own family, but also when you're at church and in your ministry, you'll be able to meet so many people and help people. And especially those people, as you said, that might be you know struggling. And I, so, I will, yeah, that's a beautiful thing. I will comment on one comment. You're never a prophet in your own land. So to my <laughs> wife, <laughs> I'm not necessarily a deacon, nor to my children. Okay. <laughs> I'm just that. I'm just, just that. That's with, right. Uh, your first vocation the, is a husband exactly. and a they, father, right? Yeah. So if exactly. I try to um, uh, uh, sit down with my children and teach them, they're like most children. They don't listen to their parents very well. Mm -hmm. I'm much more received outside of my home than I <laughs> than I am. But I know my children um, uh, very much uh, admire. Um, I try to honor them by honoring them in the role that I play and the example that I try to project to my grandchildren. I, you, you know, um, to me, um, when I go back and think about my life. One of the greatest impacts that I had in my life was that I had my grandfather who lived with us for many, many years, my mother's father. In fact, he, the home that my mother lived in and I grew up in, she lived there for 74 years. Um, her mother died um, in that house when she was 12. She took over the responsibilities of raising her five other siblings and my grandfather caring for him. And through her um, years of caring for him, he never really married until he was 86 years old. He remarried when he was 86. He was a wonderful man and a great example. And I remember from the youngest years after dinner, I'd come in and he'd grab me and he'd put me on his lap and I'd have to sit there and listen to Bishop Sheen, who used to be on TV. And as much as I didn't really probably know anything that was being said, I just like sometimes when I used to do the drawings on the, uh, on the, uh, the chalkboard, but for the most part, I didn't realize that that image and that connection to even Bishop Sheen, who I draw on in the lines of, of, um, of some wisdom for the work that I do, um, would connect me all the way back to that uh, image that I had and the experience I had with my grandfather. So I look very importantly at this, who I am and how my children's children, how my grandchildren um, see me, experience me. I want them to have a memory of me that lasts much longer than I will last in this uh, physical world. So mm. great gift. I'm glad that you share that on this podcast because also now it's there for them to listen to later on. So wonderful to hear. And I'm glad that your grandfather had such a profound impact on your life and your faith. I thought we could talk a little bit about marriage and what you do in our archdiocese. And could you give us maybe, you know, two or three tips for those listening for marriage enrichment, people who might be married and maybe they're going through some struggles because that's something that you and I both share in common with our ministries is that you're working in the Office for Life and Family and, and Marriage Enrichment. And I'm with the St. Raymond Onatus Foundation. And our primary mission is pastoral outreach to families in crisis. And marriage enrichment is a very big part of what we do too. And for anybody listening right now, want to check out our website. It's nonatus.org. If this is the first time you're meeting us, the foundation here, uh, learn about us too. But could you please uh, give us a few tips for marriage? Yes, certainly. Well, to speak, first of all, I work at, as by the description, the Office of Life and Family. 
which when you think about that, that's everything. <laughs> it's very encompassing. Um, but it really addresses um, you know, the needs of the families, which first and foremost begins with the married couple. And that's where my uh, specific focus is within the Office of Life and Family. I work uh, both in conjunction with Ascension Press and particularly a woman named Helene Holloway, who um, is my kind of co-partner through Ascension Press, who does all the marriage preparation courses, runs the courses, coordinates them, uh, manages all the registration for um, the, the marriage preparation. So the first focus is on really marriage preparation. So I have a considerable amount of influence in both the programs that the Archdiocese uh, run, influence meaning that I have input um, in, in that particular way and can help shape and address some of the needs, which by the way, we do have a very good, I believe the Archdiocese of Philadelphia puts out a, a very good program, program that, you know, by COVID was interrupted and most of it has went virtual. And very shortly, we're gonna move back, I believe, into a more in-person program, which I'm really looking forward to, as I'm sure Ascension Press is also looking to do the same. But the first focus is on marriage couples, really meeting couples as they're engaged and they're beginning to do the preparations. I pick up on many couples. I probably deal with about, I don't know, 70 to 100 couples a year in doing focus. Um, focus is the kind of the second step, if you would like, in the preparation process. There is the general marriage preparation program. Focus takes pretty much the same subjects that couples are exposed to, and now takes them to a much deeper, more intimate review. It asks both parties of the, of, of the, the engaged party to express their thoughts about, I don't know, 13 different types of subjects that are embodied within the, uh, the issue of marriage. And then I had the opportunity to kind of break out the report for them and to talk about where there are um, commonalities in their thought and where there are some differences. Um, by the way, you know, I think almost all couples in preparing for marriage, and I think all couples in general, uh, carry a difference. About 70% of our thoughts are generally the same, um, it's probably on the average 70, 75%. And the others are thoughts that in some degree have a little different gravitation. Some may be extreme, some are just a, a mild change. So the first thing I do with focus is really is to help couples to understand that none of us are perfect. Um, you can't enter into a marriage with this expectation that your spouse is going to be perfect, they're not. Um, and that you need to learn how to be able to live with the differences in a very peaceful and harmonious way. And based on my experience, um, based on my almost 50 years of marriage now, I'm a much different person than I was when I first came um, into the marriage relationship. I carried with me much of my earlier young, immature uh, thoughts, if you would like, that have been, it, the edges have been rubbed off in many respects or totally eliminated by the great um, gifts and talents that my wife has shared and vice versa. We are both very different people in many ways. We have grown to reflect each other, see each other as individuals, but reflect the common values and the common life that we have shared and formed by being together. And so um, preparation for couples is first. Marriage enrichment is the second piece, a new piece that the Archdiocese just entered into. Um, we have what's a uh, organization that the Archdiocese or the Archbishop uh, brought with him when he came from Cleveland to Philadelphia. And it's an organization called Marriages of Grace. You can um, see it on the, um, on through, through Google. It's an organization that has been around for some years and it really involves itself in marriage enrichment. They do a marriage enrichment uh, day or retreat day. And they also have something that's called Canaanites. Canaanites are just a Friday night or a Thursday night or um, some type of an evening where they invite couples into a restaurant or a bar. They have a 
general conversation about marriage. They bring somebody in who speaks a little bit and then they invite everybody to kind of share experiences. It helps build community. It helps people to understand that, yes, we're all struggling in our marriage and there's always resources. People like yourself, your organization who does great work um, in the lines of really helping people who fall into crises, which is the third thing that I do. I do some counseling with couples. Uh, my counseling is a little bit more, it's a really directly dealing with the challenges that come with marriage and not necessarily other issues that are deeper and require more professional help organizations like yours and other um, organizations or other people who are trained much better than I am in this area. So I kind of take the more simple cases, the cases that are more grounded in just the struggles and help people unravel in some degree um, those struggles. Pray to Mary of, of knots to help me to help, you know, untangle the knots because they're just, they're not really tight knots per se, but they're just knots that kind of we, we work ourselves into. And my job is, a, is a, you know, to work with couples to help them unravel it, to really rediscover, if you would like, the great love that lies always below maybe the surface of all the disruptions and problems and challenges that come with marriage. Um, mm. And so uh, there are the three components that I do. I think the greatest thing that I do um, that I, I feel great accomplishment is working one-on-one -on -one with couples, whether it's through their troubles or preparing them I, this to, to enter into this great joy and excitement. It really keeps my marriage um, uh, kind of grounded trying to help me to continually remember that great excitement, those great moments that led up to become married to my wife and the moments that have passed that sometimes get, get overshadowed by all the, the, the issues of life. And it helps me to just remember that. Always, always mention couples. You probably ought to say this, I'll embarrass you and, and, uh, and anyone else. I always remind couples, do you ever remember when you had your first date with the person that you would have married or the person you had a great connection with? That moment where, at least for a guy, I, you know, I, I touched her hand. I felt this great excitement that I was able to kind of touch her hand and then to be able to hold it, she let me hold her hand. That simple moment of excitement, that simple period where you finally kind of cross over of being two, and you start to kind of enter into this oneness. I always remind couples uh, of, that, uh, of that moment, because I think everybody has that moment. The first time you really embrace someone, it, um, it's a moment, a special moment that should be honored and remembered and celebrated because it's needed, because of the problems that marriage is also you know, that couples have to face. Not easy. No, not easy. Hey, I love that last piece. Uh, that was wonderful. And it's a good reflection for everyone listening to this podcast or watching it on video is to think about if you are married, think about those initial moments of love, right? And of love and where that led and how it led you to where you are now. Yeah. And so unfortunately, we're almost finished this podcast, but I thought before we end, um, would you be able to tell our audience and your audience where they can reach out to you if they want to connect with you or arch our life and life and family office with the archdiocese? Yes, yeah, so you would just um, you can uh, call the the just the archdiocese, ask for the office of life and family, and directly ask to speak with me. I'm not in the office. They'll give you uh, my uh, number, and um, I, I welcome anyone to give me a call. And I usually are very open night or day to speak with anybody who has a need, anybody who wants some assistance. So that's the best way of getting, just call the office. Um, if, if no one's there, you can leave a message. And I will always get back to people uh, as quickly as possible. So that's you know, beautiful. But, Thank, you know. Good to know. Now they can also go to the website, which is uh, www.archphila.org. And it's the Office for Life and Family. So that might be a way too that you can uh, connect with Deacon. Uh, I also have to mention that you are all a board member and I read it during the bio 
You're a board member for the Pro-Life Union of Greater Philadelphia, and the St. Raymond Onatus Foundation is also a member organi organization with them, and we partner with them in you know, the different projects that they do and going and attending some of the pro-life marches and things like that. Um, before we end, if you could just tell us a little bit about that, and then of course we do have to end the podcast. Okay. Um, yes, I do. I'm, I am a recent board member. I have not only I've been on the board; it's my second year in the board. And in, uh, this past January, I was asked to take the role as a treasurer. So I'm kind of the um, I handle the purse strings of the uh, the pro life union, at least kind of oversee them. Um, a great organization with a great and a very challenging mission. Um, we obviously know that the current um, environment, there's a great amount of opposition to the movement away from Roe versus Wade. Um, there is great opposition and anger and frustration um, by, uh, by many uh, that um, abortion hopefully um, will uh, be something that of a, a past event, something that is not celebrated as it is today. But in some degree, and I believe in the future, we will look back at this as a very shameful period. 66 million children that should be alive today are no longer alive um, because of, in some degree, maybe difficult circumstances. And there are many. The one thing I always try to stress, first and foremost, we must be very compassionate. We must understand that there are many struggles that women face. There's many difficulties that lead to that particular choice, but it's a choice that needs to be um, redirected to understand that the choices, there is a choice. You can choose to put your faith and your trust and your hope in God, and he will not fail you. He will not disappoint you. He will possibly cause us to pick up our cross and carry it because sometimes it is a cross. It's a great reward at the end of, that, of that, that journey. And it's a journey, unless you take that journey, unless you carry boldly that cross, you'll never be able to experience the full rewards that that brings, which kind of is like marriage in many respects. Uh, today, uh, couples want to kind of give up when things get a little hard. And I'll just kind of leave you as the broadcast here is kind of ending it. I believe you, you, you had mentioned this many little tips. I would say that, that most couples be patient. Life unfolds one day at a time. Be patient with yourself. Be patient with your spouse. Be patient with your children. Uh, be patient with God. He works also, always working, but he works in his time. And, um, and so we need to be patient in those aspects. First and foremost, we have to be very forgiving. We have to realize that we not only forgive, but we forget, much like what happens in reconciliation. The Lord forgives us for our sins, and then he forgets what it is that we've done. We have to have short memories of the problems that we, in essence, have created. We need to be thankful, and we need to be joy-filled, and we have to remember that we need to seek to be holy, to find in our marriage life and in our family life, um, a holiness that is a reflection of our everyday experiences and a holiness that will kind of drive us much closer to our Lord. Amen. Beautifully stated. Thank you so much. I'd love to have you back again for another podcast. Okay. Deacon Pat, thank you to you, your family, uh, and for that up coming grandchild that's going to be born right in, in July of 2022. God bless. This is Ann DeSantis with the St. Raymond Anatas Foundation for Freedom, Family, and Faith. Be sure to make your free pastoral consultation with us with a Mercedarian friar. That's part of what we offer is that free phone call, online call to talk about whatever your needs are in terms of that pastoral care. God bless everyone. We'll see you here next time the St. Raymond Onatus Foundation for Freedom, Family, and Faith podcast. Mm -hmm.